Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to be talking about factors affecting enzyme activity. We're going to identify how to measure reaction rates. We're going to describe what inhibition is. We're going to identify and describe molecular helpers for enzymes. We're going to define denaturation and we're going to describe the parts of an enzyme reaction curve. In this first part of this video, we're going to talk about factors that are going to affect enzyme activity, but only a, in a temporary situation. In the second part of this video, we'll talk about permanent changes to enzyme activity. Let's get started. So at the beginning of our lesson on enzymes, we had a generalized equation to show the progress of a reaction, and it looked like this. And in this equation, E represented the enzyme, S represented the substrate. ES together represented the transition state, our enzyme substrate complex. And at the end of the reaction, you had the enzyme free to do its job again, and you had the products. So when we're looking to see how effective an enzyme is or how good an enzyme is as doing its job, there's two ways we can do this. We can either, number one, measure the amount of substrate that is being consumed, and number two, how quickly the product is being formed. So either one of these can be used to judge or determine how good an enzyme is it's doing its job. Now that we can measure how quickly an enzyme is working, we can start looking at how to change that factor. And there's two ways we can do this. First, we're going to talk about non-permanent or temporary changes to an enzyme's activity. And we're going to start with inhibitors. Inhibitors are going to prevent the enzyme from doing its job. In other words, they're going to decrease enzyme activity. There's two types of inhibitors that we are going to talk about. The first is what is called a competitive inhibitor. A competitive inhibitor is going to block the active site. So think of, for example, if you have a parking space and someone else parks their car in your spot. The second type of inhibitor is what's called a non-competitive or allosteric inhibitor. In this case, the active site is not blocked, but the shape of the enzyme has changed, or more specifically, the active site may have changed its shape and is no longer able to fit with the substrate. Now that we've talked about inhibitors would prevent, which prevent the enzyme from doing its job, let's talk about helpers, molecular helpers that will enhance enzyme activity. The first of which are called cofactors. Now an, a cofactor is going to help an enzyme and it is usually an inorganic molecule. Cofactors are usually part of the enzyme itself and they can only be removed when you denature the enzyme. Some typical examples of cofactors include many metal ions like zinc, magnesium, copper, potassium. The other group of helpers are known as coenzymes. These are typically going to be organic and they are easily removed from the enzyme. Some examples of coenzymes are going to be things like vitamins. Now, there's a couple of coenzymes that I'm going to want you all to know about, and those are NAD plus and FAD2 plus. So this brings an end to our temporary changes that are going to affect enzyme activity. We talked about changes that are going to prevent or reduce enzyme activity, and we talked about factors that are going to enhance or help enzyme activity. All right, next we're going to talk about permanent changes or denaturation of an enzyme. So denaturation is when an enzyme loses its ability to uh, interact with the substrate and produce a, produce a product. And typically we think of denaturation as something that would be a permanent change. We're going to permanently turn off an enzyme. There are several factors that are going to affect enzyme activity, and we're going to look at a couple of them. So one of them is temperature. And so we're going to look at enzyme activity involved with temperature using a graph. So in looking at this graph, we're going to have along our dependent variable, 
um, enzyme activity. So either we're measuring, in this case, we're measuring the amount of product that's being produced. So we're measuring this side right here. At the beginning of the graph, we'd expect very little to no product, and we would expect it to increase over time. But as we look at temperature and the amount of product that was produced, we can see other things that are happening and explain why that is. So let's look at the graph for this temperature. Here at the top of the graph, this would be where the most amount of product is being made. We call this the optimum temperature. And at that optimum temperature, it's going to be producing the most amount of product that is possible. Now, for the enzymes in the human body, most of them are gonna be working best at about 37 degrees. But that's not the number that's going to work for every enzyme on Earth. So if you are bacteria living in a very cold ocean, then your optimum temperature is gonna be much lower than human body temperature. Now what you're seeing on this graph, on this side over here, so if this is the optimum temperature of this enzyme, let's say down here is 37 degrees, then <laughs> to the left, it's colder than 37, and to the right, it's hotter than 37 degrees. And we need to talk about what's happening because this is something you need to know for temperature. So let's start what happens or why the enzyme reactivity is very low or, or not very much when the temperature is too cold. So on this side of the graph, the enzyme is actually not denatured. What's happening is there's not enough kinetic energy for the molecules to be able to collide fast enough to get the reaction um, going at a rate that's, that would keep or sustain the, the organism or the cell. And then on the other side, over here, when the temperatures are getting too hot, now they've got plenty of kinetic energy. But what's happening is the extra temperature, the extra energy, is beginning to break the weakest bonds that are holding the enzyme together, which are those hydrogen bonds. And so the hotter it gets, the more types of bonds that you are beginning to break, starting with hydrogen bonds. And therefore, without those bonds, you start losing your quaternary and tertiary and secondary level of protein folding. And so on this side, we definitely, we say that the protein is now denatured because it's lost its shape. And so the optimum range is going to be a, a very limited range in which the, the enzyme, it's gonna do its job just right. We could draw a similar graph when we're looking at how pH affects an enzyme. So if we were looking at another graph and comparing pH, we would see that some enzymes work best at a very low pH, such as the enzymes in your stomach. Whereas some enzymes are gonna work at a much higher pH, such as the enzymes in your intestines. So in both cases, you have an optimum pH based on where the environmental conditions of those enzymes are. And if you take those enzymes and take them outside of their optimum conditions, you see that the enzyme activity drastically drops in both cases. And this is because your enzyme is becoming denatured. And so with pH, which is a measure of a hydrogen ion concentration, the, the plus sign of that hydrogen is going to interact with the R groups and it's going to change or affect the position of those R groups. So more positive charges around more positively charged R groups are gonna push away from each other and that's gonna cause a change in the shape of the enzyme. So in this video, we identified how to measure reaction rates. We described inhibition, we identified and described molecular helpers, both inhibition and molecular helpers being part of temporary changes to enzyme activity. Then for permanent changes, we define denaturation as a change, a permanent change in the shape of our enzyme, which then reduces the ability of the enzyme to interact with the substrate. And we looked at two curves one for temperature and one for pH, and we looked at the different parts of the enzyme reaction curves and how it relates to the enzyme's function. 
I hope this video was helpful. Thanks for watching. Bye.